May 24, 2021. I'm celebrating Bob Dylan's 80th birthday. Now this guy's written a bunch of my favorite songs and his influence on American music as a whole really can't be overstated. I mean, Dylan's written 600 plus songs. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2016. He sold more than 125 million records around the world. And he recently sold his publishing catalog to Universal Music. New York Times estimated that deal to be worth $300 million. So that gives you some idea of the value of Dylan's songwriting. And when we try to convert artistic expression into economics, he's the man. So to say happy birthday, we are going to scrape the frosting off his cake and get back to the batter and eggs. We're going to hear individual tracks from the original four track master of Dylan's breakthrough song, Like a Rolling Stone. Mike Bloomfield's lead guitar. Paul Griffin's Tack Piano, and Joe Macho Jr., a.k.a. Joe Mack, on bass. <music> Al Cooper on Hammond organ, Bobby Gregg on drums, and Bruce Langhorn on tambourine. course, Dylan's own rhythm guitar and one-of-a-kind vocals. How does it feel? How does it feel? So you can already hear that everything about these tracks is raw, almost bleedingly honest and unpolished, yet the combined result is the song Rolling Stone magazine put at number one on the 500 greatest songs of all time. So stick around as we go inside Bob Dylan's biggest and longest hit, over six minutes of bald-faced truth called Like a Rolling Stone. Thanks for being here to help me say happy birthday to Bob. It's time to light 80 candles and a fuse. We are gonna blow up the song. Like a rolling stone Robert Cassard here, welcome back. Please take just a second to like, subscribe, and hit the bell. And consider supporting my work on Patreon. I do post exclusive content over there for patrons only. You're going to find that link and over a hundred of my other videos on guitardiscoveries.com. So after blowing up songs from The Beatles, Stones, Who, Doors, and Hendrix, I realized I'd neglected the guy who had such a massive influence on all of them. I needed to make a U-turn back to 1965. That's the year a well-known folk artist named Bob Dylan pissed off a huge group of fans by picking up an electric guitar and turning up the volume. So Dylan released four acoustic albums between 62 and 64. And then early in 65, he put out Bringing It All Back Home. Side one featured the new electric Dylan on tunes like Subterranean Homesick Blues, Maggie's Farm, etc. But that album still had a full side of acoustic only stuff. Now by that time, Dylan was feeling heavy pressure from fans and he was tired. He'd just done a big tour of England where at each show he played an acoustic set followed by an electric set that fans generally hated. That is the tour that D.A. Pennebaker filmed for the documentary Don't Look Back. Definitely worth checking out. So after England, Dylan was actually considering dropping out of the music business altogether. So here's what he said in a 1966 Playboy interview. I was going to quit singing. I was very drained and the way things were going, it was a very draggy situation. But Like a Rolling Stone changed it all. I mean, it was something I myself could dig. It's very tiring having other people tell you how much they dig you if you yourself don't dig you. So, Like a Rolling Stone was Bob's own turning point, and it gave him the burst of energy he needed to stand up to all the fickle fans. At the 65 Newport Folk Festival, he played with a pickup group, including Mike Bloomfield and Al Cooper, who both played on the record, and they were booed and heckled, and Dylan left the stage after three songs. And through most of that year and the next, Dylan's live concerts often involved confrontations with his original folk fans. There was a show in Manchester, England. Someone in the audience yelled out, Judas! Here's a clip. Listen to how Dylan responds and what he says to the band. Judas! I don't believe 
believe you. You're a liar. He tells them to play it effing loud. And of course, they launched into Like a Rolling Stone. Anyway, Dylan ultimately won the electric gambit big time because the conflict brought him a lot of attention and a lot of new fans. Here was a former folk singer with a limited audience who's suddenly a rock star with seemingly unlimited reach. Okay, let's go back to 1965, the recording of the album Highway 61 Revisited, and the opening track, Like a Rolling Stone. Tom Wilson's producing, and he'd produced Bringing It All Back Home earlier that year, but it was a bit of an odd pairing because Wilson was actually a jazz cat who'd become one of Columbia's budding rock producers. So they're recording at Columbia Records Studio A on 7th Avenue in New York, which you can see outlined in red in this photo. And the band is some Dylan regulars. There's Bobby Gregg on drums, Bruce Langhorn, who was actually the real subject of Mr. Tambourine Man, and he's actually playing tambourine, and Paul Griffin on piano. Joe Macho, aka Joe Mack, is on bass. And there are also two guitarists at the studio, in addition to Dylan himself. Bob had invited the Chicago blues guitarist Mike Bloomfield from the Paul Butterfield Blues Band, and Tom Wilson had a young session guitarist named Al Cooper there. He was just a guest, and he didn't end up playing guitar, but he did play the organ, which was not his instrument until this song made him an organist. The entire recording process is documented on one disc in a box set called The Cutting Edge 1965 to 66, The Bootleg Series, Volume 12, Deluxe Edition. Okay, disc three has 20 tracks of early takes, false starts, rehearsals, and the master tracks. So if you wanna hear everything, check that out. On June 15, they took five stabs at Like a Rolling Stone. Dylan's on piano, not guitar, and he's singing in a 3-4 waltz tempo. Here's a little clip. So I know Like a rolling stone now The next day, they reconvene, and it's clear Dylan has a totally new vision for the song. Now it's a rock song, it's in 4-4 time, and He's still making lyric and melody changes, but he's definitely feeling it in a new way. So they fumble around for a few takes, and then they get to take four, and they make it all the way to the end. And from the control room, you can hear Tom Wilson say, that sounds good to me. Good. I think he knew something magical had happened, and at a minimum, they actually played the whole song. So let's listen to the track stems and hear what each guy brought to the party. Now keep in mind, this is 1965, so this is just a four-track master tape with everything recorded live at the same time. There are no overdubs at all. All of them have just learned the song, and it's still evolving with each take. And that explains why a bunch of really talented session musicians are still making lots of mistakes. Those mistakes are really obvious when you solo each track, but this recording, probably more than any other big hit I can think of, really shows that authenticity and spontaneity absolutely beat perfection when it comes to emotional impact. Let's start with the lead guitar, which was recorded to its own track. Now, Mike Bloomfield was a blues monster, but kind of oddly, Dylan had told him not to play any of that B.B. King stuff. I assume meaning bluesy note bends, but that was really Bloomfield's whole style. So he had to come up with a different approach to the song. And it was probably way outside his comfort zone. So he ended up playing arpeggiated chords through the whole song. There's really no lead guitar or solo. playing his white 63 Telecaster, probably straight into a Fender amp, so it's pretty clean most of the time. But the amp is turned up just loud enough that it has some delicious tube crunch when he plays louder on the suspended fourth riffs before and after each chorus. I 
always listen for those riffs. So Bloomfield was a blues legend who died too young, and he deserves all the claim he's gotten over the years. But when you hear his solo tracks, there are a few times he's clearly lost. Here's another one. He always regains his musical footing and does something perfect at the essential moments in the song. I actually think his overall contribution is a big reason why this song stays fresh over six minutes plus. So the piano and bass share one track. Paul Griffin's piano has kind of a tinny barroom sound. It's actually called a tack piano because they put tacks in the hammers, so they have this sharp attack hitting the strings. Now, it's funny because as many times as I've heard this record, I've rarely given any thought to the piano part. So when I heard the track soloed, I thought it was loaded with surprises because there's just so much going on. Sometimes it's kind of honky-tonk. <laughs> Sometimes it almost feels Latin. There are these cool moments of melodic octaves that feel a little gospel. So it's really a total hodgepodge, but somehow it works just fine. Now the bass is played by Joe Macho, who was born in Prague, came to Philadelphia, became a session guy, and he eventually played with all kinds of artists like jazz dudes, Herbie Mann, Charlie Bird, Les McCann, people like that, to folk and rock artists like Van Morrison, Janice Ian, Jim Croce, John Denver. He's got a really thin bass tone on this song by today's standards, but it does cut through. Just like the other guys, there are times when Joe Mack totally misses the note. He doesn't know where Dylan's going with the chords, you know, but he just keeps plowing through and gets it done. Probably the most confident performances are from Bobby Gregg on drums and Bruce Langhorn on tambourine. So after faltering and having a little bit of a hard time finding the feel in the early takes, Gregg just nails it on take four, and Langhorn has no trouble just enhancing what Gregg is doing. Hey. Along with the drums and tambourine is the famous organ part from Al Cooper, which includes this melody. That's the one everyone sings along with. But actually, that part was a fluke. See, Cooper was a 21-year-old session guitarist, right? Not an organist. He was there as a guest of Tom Wilson, and he brought his guitar just hoping to play on a Dylan song. But when he heard Bloomfield warming up and playing some smoke and blues guitar. He was so intimidated, he just put his guitar back in the case. Paul Griffin had been on the Hammond organ, but after a couple rehearsals, Wilson moved him over to the piano. And at that point, Cooper told Wilson he had a good idea for an organ part. And Wilson just scoffed because he, he knew that Cooper was not a legit organ player. But then Wilson stepped out for a phone call, and when he came back in, Cooper was already out in the studio sitting at the Hammond. He just played on the next take, and that was it. When Dylan heard what Cooper played, 
he wanted it louder in the mix. So that is how one very intimidated guitar player became an organ player and a legendary organ player. And just like all the other musicians, there are plenty of times when Cooper falters. But when he's on, he nails it. And that melody you can never forget. So back then the Columbia console didn't have panning controls. So when they did a stereo mix, it either went hard left, hard right, or center. So we already have piano and bass mixed left. And now we got the drums, tambourine, and organ mixed to the right, and the lead guitar's over there too. And that leaves one more track, which is Bob Dylan's rhythm guitar and vocals. This is the one track that's centered in the stereo mix. Now to my ear, this is really the perfect encapsulation of what makes Dylan unique as a wordsmith in the way he marries chords and melodies and as kind of an everyman rhythm guitarist with limited skills. The story goes that Dylan extracted the four verses and choruses of Like a Rolling Stone from a long piece of vomit, 20 pages long. That's what how Dylan described it. There's been tons of speculation about who inspired the song and who the characters are, like Miss Lonely, The Mystery Tramp, The Diplomat, and Napoleon and Rags. And when I realized I'd be treading on this hallowed Dylan ground, I contacted an old school friend of mine, Ken Wetman. He admits to suffering from Dylanophilia, as he calls it. Obviously a lifelong rabid Dylan fan. So I asked him, you know, what am I likely to miss when I blow up like a Rolling Stone? He mentioned his own fascination with this tragic life of the song's likely muse, uh, Miss Lonely, Edie Sedgwick. She was part of Andy Warhol's Superstars entourage, and, and she also deserves the credit for introducing the miniskirt to pop culture. But my friend Ken also said, it really doesn't matter who the characters are. And that's true, because like all of Dylan's best lyrics, these words could apply broadly to almost anyone in any situation. So on the surface, he's singing to Miss Lonely, who previously lived a privileged lifestyle. Once upon a time you dressed so fine Through the bumps of dime in your prime Then you Now she finds herself out on her own. She's directionless, facing the harsh realities of life. She's really been cut down to size. Now you don't talk so loud now you don't seem so proud about having to be scrounging your next meal. There are lots of times when Dylan is sort of sneering the lyrics and he seems to be reveling in Miss Lonely's comeuppance. But he also realizes she's gained a whole new freedom from being anonymous and, and not being afraid of what others will think of her. When you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. You're invisible now, you got no secrets to conceal. Perfect example of why Dylan's lyrics are often so brilliant. He generally avoids, you know, the preachy, positive, negative, black and white messages. It's all about the gray areas. And the chorus is the perfect payoff because it doesn't tell us what to think or feel. It just asks a question. How does it feel to be on your own with no direction home? A complete unknown, like a rolling stone. That's a question that's relevant to almost everyone at some point in their life when they feel lost and alone. And Dylan has also said that all his lyrics are ultimately about himself. And, you know, how does it feel to be on your own? It's got to be a question he could relate to, especially thinking about how estranged he was from his early folk fans. But again, on the surface, it's a song about a woman who's fallen from grace and has to fend for herself. Now, it could mean other things. You know, the metaphors can work on a bigger scale, too. What if he's singing to the United States, to the government and to the society, and talking about our collective fall from grace, circa 65? You know, everything used to look so perfect, but we always took half-hearted care of our own. 
you know, once upon a time you dressed so fine, threw the bums a dime in your prime, didn't you? But now the truth is out. You know, we've lost our moral authority. We're spending money, losing lives in Vietnam, and we can't even feed our own people. So now you don't seem so proud about having to be scrounging your next meal. You know, you get the idea. Now, I'm not saying this is what Dylan meant by the words, but it's one interpretation. And if you read all the lyrics through that kind of lens, it's pretty interesting. Okay, let's talk about that melody. It's the unresolved power of a suspended fourth. There's the chord, but it's, how does it feel? How does it feel? It's an F when the chord is clearly doesn't contain an F. How does it feel? Deliberately unresolved. So it's actually a musical answer to the question he's asking. How does it feel? You know, the answer is it's tense and unresolved. And it keeps coming back to that suspended fourth in each chorus. How does it feel? How does it feel? So musically, the song uses basic chords. They're all within the home key of C. As my friend Ken put it, doesn't that initial C chord grab your attention? Yeah, it does. Because it is like home, you know, and it, and it sets us up to travel pretty far from home over the next six minutes. All right, so the verses are a full 16 bar pattern. They start by just climbing up the scale. You go from C to D minor to E minor to F to G, right? That's the one, two minor, three minor, four, five, and it does that twice. And then it goes F to G, which is the four chord, to the five chord, does that again, F to G, four chord to the five chord, and then it descends, four, three minor, two minor, one, two times, four, three minor, two minor, one. And then it goes back to the two minor, which is the D minor chord, to the four, which is F, and to the five, which is G, for two bars of buildup. And that's when Bloomfield plays his own suspended fourth fills, you know. That whole deal. And then the chorus is a straight one, four, five, C, F, G. And it just repeats as many times as it needs to for Dylan to say everything he needs to say. The whole song is a total of four verses and four choruses. There's no bridge, no solos. That's another way Dylan often breaks the rules. So after take four, all the musicians knew they'd made mistakes. And that's probably why Dylan and the band just kept trying to get it right for 11 more takes, 11 more takes. They never even came close to matching the intensity and the freshness of that magical take four. And because Dylan is a guy who's known for never singing the exact same melody twice, everything about the way he sang it and built the tension and resolution on take four really feels like the only way he could have sung it. The rock critic Grill Marcus wrote a book called Like a Rolling Stone, Bob Dylan at the Crossroads. In that book, he details the whole recording process of this song, and he comes to realize what a miraculous accident it was that things came together that one and only take. So after listening to all the bad takes and the false starts, he says this, circling around the song like hunters surrounding an animal that has escaped them a dozen times, they caught it. That's what makes an event after all. It can only happen once. I, for one, am certainly glad that happened. And I'm glad it helped Dylan refocus on songwriting so we could be here going on 60 years with hundreds of more Dylan songs in our heads and in our hearts. So the sound of this record is so familiar by now, it's kind of hard to imagine how revolutionary it sounded when it hit the radio in the summer of 65. I mean, here was a song that was over six minutes long, so it demolished the rule that pop songs needed to max out at about three minutes. A lot of the radio stations did hesitate to play it, but then the listeners demanded it, and it got all the way up to number two in the U.S., only behind Help by the Beatles. So think of those two songs sitting side by side at the top of the charts, really changing how direct and honest hit songs could be. One fun footnote. Like a Rolling Stone was the last song Tom Wilson ever produced for Bob Dylan. But later that afternoon, in the very same studio with some of the same musicians, Wilson produced another classic. He added the electric guitar, bass, and drums to Simon and Garfunkel's Sound of Silence. And of course, that electric version came out as a single, and that became another defining, deep, and poetic number one hit of 65. 
All right, thanks for being here to blow up the song. Please leave a comment. Tell me what are your memories of Bob Dylan? What does he mean to you? And what does this song mean to you? Don't forget to pass the video along to your fellow Dylanites too. FYI, Ken Wetman says, this number is best heard loud with the windows down on Ventura Highway. And I have no doubt about that. All right, happy 80th to you, Bob. I gotta say, blowing up like a Rolling Stone and hearing all the rough edges, you really did teach us how to break all the rules in all the right ways. So until your next birthday and the birthdays beyond, keep on rolling.